Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Animaction. Welcome to my Animated 80s series. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to check my Instagram, and as usual, don't forget to like and subscribe, and tell any of the other cartoon fans you know too. And lastly, if any of you out there are readers, I just thought I'd mention that I have a book out. The Kindle edition is available on Amazon for just a few bucks, so if you like contemporary sci-fi and fantasy with an 80s adventure feel, check it out and support the channel. So last year I talked about how animation expanded into new territory by proving several different media could be viable as cartoons, like Star Wars and wrestling. I also mentioned the US's expanding reach, bringing in new cartoons from even more countries, and the hints we saw about the way the future would look with programming blocks starting to make an appearance. And lastly, I mentioned the efforts to combat the concerns being voiced by parent groups against children's media. There really was a lot going on with cartoons in the 80s, and it doesn't slow down anytime soon. Will 1986 support that assertion? Let's take a look. As usual, we'll start by seeing what managed to hang on from previous years. 1980 finally dropped its last holdout and had no more representation from 85 forward. The Smurfs was still here from 1981, but there was nothing left from 82 either. From the 83 lineup, we still had G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, Inspector Gadget, and Elvin and the Chipmunks on cable, with Disney Channel still showing Donald Duck Presents and Good Morning Mickey, which would both run for the rest of the decade. The Transformers, Snorks, Muppet Babies, and Danger Mouse were still around from 1984, and from last year, we still had Ewoks, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, It's Punky Brewster, Mask, Scooby's Mystery Funhouse, Super Sunday slash Saturday, The Bernstein Bears, She-Ra, Princess of Power, Adventures of the Gummy Bears, CBS Story Break, The Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera, Thundercats, and The Raccoons. Not bad at all, but let's see what that means we lost. From this point on, I'll be expanding this section to look at not just the previous year, but what we lost overall, with a particular focus on action shows. I especially wanted to do this starting with this year because of how painful it was. Dungeons and Dragons, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, and Mr. T all ended their runs in 1985, as well as Voltron and Challenge of the Gobots, so those were some significant losses that 1986 brought us. From the 1985 lineup though, we also lost Banana Man, The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, Captain Harlock and the Queen of a Thousand Years, Care Bears, Transor Z, Jace and the Wheeled Warriors, Little Muppet Monsters, Robotech, Sectars, Star Wars Droids, The Wuzzles, The Jetsons, and the Superpowers team Galactic Guardians, which was actually a loss of the entire Super Friends series, as this was the last show we'd get from it. I mentioned that from this point on we'd start to see more of the one and done cartoons that ended after a single season, and we see that here with some excellent shows like Robotech, Jace, and Sectars. Unfortunately, it only gets worse from here, but we'll cross that bridge later. For now, let's see what new adventures 1986 had in store. The answer, in short, was a lot. We had 27 new shows pop up on airwaves this year, and a lot of them are staples of this channel. We had a ton of action, the rebirth of several classics, the first steps toward a new genre, some limits being pushed, and some controversy. There were a couple of important firsts in productions and choice of properties, and a couple of home runs on cable networks. It was a pretty packed year, so instead of listing everything here, let's just go straight to the deep dive. So like in years past, there were some returns of classic cartoon characters this year, but some came with a twist. The Bugs Bunny and Tweety show made sure that classic Looney Tunes maintained a presence on air. The Flintstones had a pretty literal rebirth where they drank deep from the Muppet well. Flintstone kids reimagined the adult characters from the original series as much younger preteens and followed their mischievous adventures around Bedrock. Johnny Quest also made a return this year with the new adventures of Johnny Quest. The show had such a timeless formula though that there really weren't any changes or updates necessary. Another character to find new life this year was Dennis the Menace, who started out as a comic strip character in 1951 and then the star of his own sitcom in 1959. This series centered on him and his dog Ruff causing no end of trouble for neighbor Mr. Wilson in a modern suburbia. Several classic pulp and comic strip characters from the 30s got picked up and rolled into a single series as the Defenders of the Earth. This show took classic characters Flash Gordon, the Phantom, Mandrake the Magician, and Mandrake's best friend and companion Lothar and updated them into a modern sci-fi setting. It was an awesome show combining high concept science fiction with magic and superpowers to create a pretty unique setting. And speaking of fairly old characters and putting them in a sci-fi setting, we also got a new anthology series this year that brought us our first French cartoon based on a character from sometime around the 8th century BC. Ulysses 31 took the story of Ulysses from Homer's Odyssey, the Greek epic poem, not the episode of The Simpsons, and put it wholesale into a sci-fi setting, with Zeus taking the memory of how to return to Earth from Ulysses and his family and forcing them to wander space. It was an interesting take on Greek mythology, but I learned the hard way that it wasn't really accurate enough to base a book report on. 
We've talked in the past about my feelings on the whole 30-minute toy commercial label, but there were some releases this year that made the argument a difficult one for our side. Potato Head Kids, Pound Puppies, Popples, and Laser Tag Academy were all series from 1986 that came out in support of toy lines. Toy lines that had absolutely no story component whatsoever. I know this isn't the first time we've seen this, looking at you, Rubik, but it's the first time we've seen it in this large volume. I mean, seriously, we had a Creative Face toy, two different plushes, and a light gun combat game, and each one was made into a show with storylines and characters and everything. Popples told the story of a group of neon-colored creatures who could roll themselves into balls. That was the niche of the toys as well. And though the toys also had names that were used in the cartoon, that's where the backstory stopped. It ran as part of Kitty OTV with Ulysses 31, along with reruns of the Get Along Gang and a new season of Rainbow Bright. Pound Puppies was a series of plush dogs that came in cardboard dog houses when they were released. The toys were pretty much just known by breed, but the cartoon fleshed them out with names and a full storyline. This series even got a 2010 reboot. And then you had Laser Tag Academy, which was based on a toy line consisting of a laser, a sensor, and some accessories. The line didn't even have characters, but it turned into an animated series involving time travel and a villain trying to destroy the main character's ancestors. Weirdest part was, though, that the show was actually pretty good, and at least it wasn't live action like its competitor series, Photon. Well, so far in the 80s, we've taken shows from Japan, the UK, Canada, Belgium, and as stated earlier, from France this year. But we didn't just look to other countries for new shows in the 80s. We also looked within, at other media. Mr. T and Hulk Hogan had shown the viability of real-life celebrities getting an animated adaptation, so this year, studios tried the same thing with Chuck Norris, releasing the animated miniseries and toy line for Chuck Norris' Karate Commandos. This show cast Chuck in the role of a secret agent, complete with a support team and a sidekick, protecting the world from the likes of Super Ninja. It was very goofy but also very fun, with live-action segments of Chuck introducing every episode, similar to the earlier Mr. T formula. We also got a big-name Hollywood director trying their hand at animation this year, with the Japanese import Galaxy High School, by seminal 80s filmmaker Chris Columbus. Columbus was best known for movies like Gremlins and The Goonies, among many, many, many others. The show was produced through TMS Entertainment, a Japanese anime producer mostly known for shows like Urusei Yatsura, and this was their attempt to bring that formula to the U.S. market, as the original story was about an alien attending school on Earth, whereas this one is about humans attending school in space. Star Wars proved the previous year that spin-offs of a franchise could prove wildly successful, and it wasn't even the first movie to do so, as the Planet of the Apes franchise had released an animated series in the 70s. However, this was the year that TV execs started really testing the waters to see how far they could take that idea. They did so this year with the release of Teen Wolf, the animated series. This show took the foundation of what was established in the Teen Wolf movie from the previous year starring Michael J. Fox and expanded the hijinks and adventures. But Teen Wolf was rated PG and didn't really get edgy and dark until the CWified version from 2011. Side note, it looks like there's a darker Teen Wolf remake coming sometime this year. Someone should really tell Hollywood that our childhood is dead and they should leave its corpse alone. Anyway, that's not the really significant movie adaptation I wanted to mention from this year. The one I found really important was Rambo, The Force of Freedom, which adapted an R-rated movie about a Vietnam Special Forces vet with PTSD waging a bloody and violent war against a small town in the American Northwest. Sure, I, well, and I'd be willing to guess a lot of you, saw 1982's First Blood way earlier than we should have, but I'm not sure that was grounds for turning it into an animated series. Some production company specifically in this case Ruby Spears, did though, and the show was really pretty great. That set an interesting precedent that we'll be revisiting through the rest of the decade. There was one other movie that got an animated adaptation this year, but if you say its name, it's not the show you'll be referring to. Ghostbusters was a smash hit in 1984 and appealed to audiences of all ages, chain smoking notwithstanding, and made a great concept for an animated series. Unfortunately, Filmation thought so too, and they already had a Ghostbusters TV show from 1975 that they were happy to bring back. Needless to say, this name conflict became a serious issue between them and Deke, with Columbia Pictures and Deke worried that the name recognition would mean viewers navigated to Filmation's show. That wasn't a bad thing, mind you. The Filmation Ghostbusters series was actually a ton of fun, with one of the Ghostbusters being a gorilla, a sentient transforming ghost car, and plenty of other neat concepts. But it wasn't the Ghostbusters that 1986 audiences recognized. Those Ghostbusters were what Columbia and Deke considered to be the real Ghostbusters, and that's the show we got. It was a continuation of the adventures of our four favorite ghost hunting heroes from the previous year in animated form. 
The show introduced a revolving door of new ghosts with motivations beyond a simple boo, new tech and gadgets for our heroes, and a lot more expanded characterization and backstory. Plus, it made Slimer a hero and put both Janine and Rick Moranis' Lewis Tully in proton packs at different points in the series. Did the name change hurt the show, though? Considering that the Filmation version lasted for a single 65-episode season, while the real Ghostbusters went on to 140 episodes and a 13-episode Slimer spinoff over seven years on the air, I'd have to say no. So I'm not sure if you were all aware of this, but westerns used to be big. Bigger than big. They were the genre in media. At least until the early 60s, when sci-fi started to pick up steam. No pun intended. And as I mentioned in one of the earliest videos in the series, the kids who grew up watching those westerns were the modern-day producers of our favorite animation. That's why we had the Lone Ranger at the beginning of the decade, or lasting characters like Yosemite Sam and Quick Draw McGraw. 80s kids, though, had different sensibilities, and a guy on a horse with a revolver wasn't going to cut it for us. A guy on a robot horse with a laser revolver, though, well, that's a whole different story. And that's what we got this year with the release of The Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers. This show took the base Wild West premise of territory expansion, put it in space, gave us cowboys with robots and superpowers, and ran wild. Sure, there were some instances of the idea in the past, with the original Star Trek series having a western episode or two, and maybe some other properties that were given the label of space western, but this was the first top-to-bottom western series set in space, and it was pretty glorious. It took the western concept, applied a small helping of the anime ongoing story, incorporated all of the best elements of sci-fi with tech, human augmentation, alien species, and awesome space combat, and rolled them into a completely new concept. I can't praise this series enough, as in my opinion, it's the foundation that shows like Cowboy Bebop, Trigun, and even Firefly, just to name a few, were built on. I wish these DVDs were still in print, because I urge you all to check out this awesome show. Also, for the record, it never even got a toy line here in the US, managing a 65 episode run based solely on the strength of its own storytelling. We also got a second sci-fi fantasy and western mashup this year in the form of Wildfire which told the story of a princess named Sarah from another dimension and her mystical talking horse Wildfire trying to avoid an evil queen named Diabolin, who took over Sarah's kingdom and killed her mother. Sarah was raised on a ranch in modern-day, well, 80s modern-day, Montana, and once old enough returned to her kingdom with Wildfire at her side to retake it. It was a pretty interesting series and used a concept we'd actually see a lot of in different movies and series after this point. I'm sure they made mental notes of series like Popples, Pound Puppies, and Wildfire, which I know that I, as a boy, didn't really watch back then. This year also included shows like My Little Pony and Friends with the show within a show called Moon Dreamers, the previously mentioned second season of Rainbow Bright, and Kissy Fur, which had the word kiss in the title and ensured there was no chance in hell that eight-year-old me would watch it. As far as my third grade self was concerned, all of these shows were the domain of girls only, and may as well have been infomercials for as willing as I was to sit through them. But I knew plenty of 80s girls. Not, like, knew them, but they were in my class. I would never actually talk to girls, ew, gross, that loved them all. I even had some paternal twin cousins, the boy of which had a room full of He-Man and Voltron, and whose sister had a ton of Rainbow Bright and ponies. I think it was easier to cross No Man's Land in World War I than the gender divide in 80s cartoons, and it split even further this year. We also got Foofer this year, which was a lot more gender neutral, but I really didn't know where else to put it, so I'm mentioning it here. That's some A-plus planning, huh? Oh, and Jem also got her own full series this year. It was honestly a pretty cool show, kind of combining Hannah Montana, ironically before Miley Cyrus was even born, with a Battle of the Band Save the Orphanage story. Not only that, but for a show with a small cast, it was impressively ethnically diverse. There's some good fun to be had here, so check it out. The series. The, the cartoon one. Not the live-action movie from 2015. Definitely not that one. I've mentioned a few times how we got several cartoons from other countries prior to this year. Well, we got a couple of interesting ones this year as well. Not just interesting because they came from Japan and France, but interesting because they exclusively aired on Nickelodeon and kind of set the stage for Nick to become a major player and not just a niche network going forward. These shows came in the form of The Mysterious Cities of Gold, originally aired in Japan as Esteban, Child of the Sun in 1982, and Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea originally aired in France as Le Monde and Glautis, or The Engulfed Worlds, in 1985. The Mysterious Cities of Gold was a unique story set in the 16th century during the Spanish colonization of Central America, and followed the adventures of a Spanish orphan and his two young friends searching for one of the fabled cities of gold. Along the way, they discover several artifacts of the Mu civilization, which is an Atlantis-like lost city that you may have heard of. 
It was really an interesting show filled with mythology and history and proved to be a pretty big hit for Nickelodeon. The other show here, Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea, was less of a hit but no less interesting. This show also told the story of a lost civilization, Arcadia, but had the twist of being told from the perspective of some of its citizens who didn't know that the rest of the world still existed. Their civilization exists deep underground where it's sustained by an artificial sun, but that sun is dying. The series follows the adventures of a pair of kids who defy the laws of the land to send a messenger to the surface, eventually meeting a pair of kids from Topside who they joined forces with to save their world. Again, this series looked really cool, but it seems mostly lost today, unfortunately. And finally, we get to my channel's bread and butter, action. I say finally, but there were plenty of series already mentioned in this video that fit nicely into that category as I define it. The Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers, Defenders of the Earth, both Ghostbusters shows, Ulysses 31, Rambo and the Force of Freedom, Laser Tag Academy, Wildfire, Mysterious Cities of Gold, and Spartacus would all slide comfortably into this category, but the list doesn't stop there. I've got four other shows that need to be mentioned here, and each is more awesome than the last, or the next, or whatever. They're all awesome, is what I'm trying to say. First, we have yet another Japanese import to mention this year with Macron 1. This is another one of the supergiant robot anime to find its way to US airways during this decade, this time adapting the original series Go Shogun, combined with the sprinkling of, hold on, let me take a breath here, great military operation in subspace sprungle, or if you prefer, mission outer space sprungle. And that was quite a mouthful. Plus I have absolutely no idea what the hell a sprungle is. Anyway, Macron 1 was a show that pieced these two series together to tell the story of a test pilot who accidentally opened a door to an alternate universe letting an alien into ours, yada yada, you guys know the trope. The aliens are called Grip, and there are two teams from this version of Earth fighting as a resistance, the Go Shogun and the Sprungle teams, conveniently enough, and our test pilot main character ends up working with them as a member of the Macron, or Go Shogun force, to defend Earth. And speaking of defending Earth, I mean, not the defenders of the Earth, as we've already talked about that, but rather defending as a verb. This year saw the release of the Inhumanoids as a part of the Super Sunday or Saturday or whatever day it aired in your geography. This show was about a team of scientists, because some of the biggest badasses in the 80s were the biggest brains, using some awesome suits of power armor to defend the planet against the Inhumanoids, who were like elemental-themed kaiju. It was a cool show with cool monsters, cool mechs, and cool vehicles. And speaking of cool characters and cool mechs, we also got one of the greats of the decade this year with Centurions, or Centurions Power Extreme if you want search parameters that won't have Google returning endless articles on ancient Rome. This was another great series about a team of specialized agents defending the world against Doc Terror and his henchman Hacker. Watching it today, I can see how kind of silly it was, as the Centurions didn't really do anything fighting Doc Terror and his robots that the normal military couldn't have done just as effectively. And it was the standard 80s story of, sure, three guys can protect the whole world, but it's weird how absolutely none of that matters. The show's still great, and I still love it. My only real complaint is the character names. Ace McCloud? May as well call him Pilot McFlying Guy. But that brings me to the last series I want to cover this year, which I've heard called a Thundercats spin-off or a Thundercats rip-off, but which I don't really consider to be either of those things. I'm talking about the very cool cartoon Silverhawks. I absolutely love this show and everything about it. The character designs were great, the Mirage was one of the coolest vehicles of the 80s, and the story we got was pretty comprehensive. Similarities to Thundercats consisted of, I guess, there being five members initially, having an animal theme, and having a bad guy that changed forms. Otherwise, these shows differentiated enough that I really don't consider them related at all. And yes, I know of their real-world relationship, but I mean the storytelling and the world-building aspects. This was just a well-thought-out and developed show, with the showrunners even considering the potential complaints and making sure the story covered the scientific shortcomings, like breathing in space. If you think it's Thundercats with bird people, I urge you to give it a watch today with a more critical eye. There was definitely enough here to stand on its own. Alright everyone, we all know that I almost exclusively focus on traditional animation on this channel, or at least in this series. However, there was one other show from this year that I just didn't feel right leaving out of this video and I'd be surprised if any of you couldn't guess what it was. This year brought us one of the weirdest, wackiest, wildest highlights for a lot of us 80s kids, Pee Wee's Playhouse. Sure, it wasn't animated in the traditional sense, but I'd be willing to make the argument that it's just as much a cartoon as anything else on this list. Not only that, but it laid the entire foundation that several cartoons going forward, things like Ren and Stimpy, built themselves on. I can't really emphasize how much of a head trip this show was and how little sense it usually made, but I'm not sure if I can emphasize its impact either, and that's why it gets a mention here. 
Which brings us at last to my rundown of where each of these 1986 series can be watched as of June 2023. Unfortunately, there are plenty for which the task is not a particularly easy one. Several series, including Macron 1, Laser Tag Academy, Wildfire, Potato Head Kids, Pound Puppies, Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea, Foo Fur, and Kissy Fur have never seen a DVD release. The Inhumanoids, Ulysses 31, and Rambo and the Force of Freedom all did have DVD releases at one point, but they're currently out of print and outrageously priced. Well, that's not entirely true. For those of you who parlo Italiano, there's an Italian language version of Ulysses 31 available. There's also a Region 2 set of both seasons of The Lost Cities of Gold, if you have a region-free DVD player, or if you're looking for a cheaper alternative, the first season can be purchased on Prime Video as well. A handful of other series can also be purchased on Prime Video, like Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers, Defenders of the Earth, both of whom's DVDs are currently out of print, Galaxy High School, and the Flintstone Kids, and a couple others can be found on streaming, with Teen Wolf available on Pluto TV and My Little Pony and Friends on Tubi. Everything else can be picked up on DVD, though, including Centurions, Ghostbusters, The Real Ghostbusters, Karate Commandos, Rainbow Bright, The Get Along Gang, Popples, Silverhawks, Pee Wee's Playhouse, The New Adventures of Johnny Quest, and Dennis the Menace. Not to sound like a broken record here, but seriously, everyone, get them while they last. And that's it, everybody. Everything that 1986 had to offer us 80s kids. All in all, I think it was a pretty great year. There were quite a few shows released that I personally consider classics, as well as a surprising number of firsts that would become trends throughout the rest of the decade. But let me know what you thought of the year and its lineup in the comments. My personal favorite was Silverhawks, so go ahead and share your as well as any thoughts, feedback, or whatever you want to talk about. As usual, subscribe if you haven't already. Check my Instagram for the tune of the week and some expanded 80s goodness, and come back next week for a look at 1987. Stay tuned and stay tuned as in cartoons. Later.